thank you very much, David. It's lovely to be with you again. Um, the first topic I wanted to ask you about was uh, black swans. Mm -hmm. we, we hear a little bit about these, but perhaps you could start by explaining exactly what they are. Yes, it's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Um, it first came about uh, actually in 1692. Uh, the origin of the phrase is because uh, we know for certain in Europe and, and our part of the world that all swans are white. It's a known fact. And um, so a you know, big bird lives on the water, long neck, big wings, and, uh, and it's white, and it's a swan. And in 1692, a Dutch explorer discovered Australia and uh, went inland and was looking at the natural flora and fauna and found this bird, big bird, lives on water, long neck, big wings, black. So it clearly can't be a swan by definition because we know that all swans are white. Um, and so they, gave it, they created a whole completely different uh, species name, uh, not Cygnus because it can't be a swan because it's not white. Um, and so it was a one member species. And then in the, about 1760, they brought us uh, an example or several back to London uh, examined them more closely and discovered they are actually exactly the same, just a different colour uh, feather. So the concept of the black swan is used as something which we know for certain can't be true until it's true. It's the completely unexpected. You know we talk about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. The black swan is an unknowable unknown. It's outside of your frame of reference. You can't even conceive of it as being true. So it's something that you cannot know because of your limited worldview until you discover it. And so in the world of risk management, we use uh, black swans to talk about emergent risks, risks which come at you from left field or, or out of the blue. And you can't see them coming because you can't even imagine that they might be there. So you don't see a black swan until it's right in front of you and hits you. And those are the unpredictable uh, risks. The term was first used in risk management in about 2005 and a book was published called Black Swans, the uh, impact of the, uh, of, of the highly improbable. And there was a Lebanese financier called Nicholas Nassim Taleb who wrote the book, made a fortune out of the book, and the term became more popularly used. Uh, and can you explain to me exactly how they really matter for projects then? Well, you see, risk management is about managing risks, and risks are uncertainties that matter. So the idea is to be predictive and proactive. So in risk management, you look ahead, you scan the future, you see the things that are coming towards you, good or bad, and then you respond to that appropriately. So if you see a big thing, a big bad thing coming towards you very fast, you avoid it, you step out of the way, or you put up some kind of barrier, or you protect yourself. If you see a big good thing which is coming towards you but which might miss you, an opportunity, then you step into its path so you can exploit it or capture it, and you make yourself more open to the opportunity. That depends on seeing it coming. So in order to be predictive and proactive in risk management, you've got to see the risk coming. Black swans just emerge fully formed out of the mist. You never saw them coming and suddenly they're there. But they are uncertain. We don't know where they are, how many there are, how big they are, when they might arrive. And they certainly matter in terms of affecting our projects and our ability to manage them. But we can't use traditional risk management because traditional risk management depends on predicting the thing before it happens. So if they're by definition not knowable, then what can we actually do or be prepared to do about them? Yes, a lot of people say, well, emergent risks aren't risks at all, because by the time they happen, then they're problems, issues, constraints, crisis, disaster, whatever it might be. And if it doesn't happen and you never knew about it, well, then, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, so maybe this is part of the role of, uh, of issue management or crisis management or problem management. We would say in the risk management world, you can still do something in advance to prepare yourself or protect yourself for something that you can't see. And we do this in the world of the, the wider world of business through business continuity management. So the idea of BCM is something might happen which threatens the continuity of your business. So you prepare for something by building in flexibility, by building in some kind of contingency plan. You develop a BCP, a business continuity plan, and you rehearse it, and then something happens and you respond. So it might be that our entire IT goes down for a week. We don't know what might make that happen, but if that did happen, here's our backup plan. And we have redundant systems and we have um, you know, backup uh, locations and so on. 
It might be that something happens that stops half our people getting to work for a long period of time. We don't know what the something is, but if it happens, then here's our business continuity plan. So what we can do in the similar way for projects is to have a project continuity plan that says if something happens which could affect our ability to achieve our objectives and we don't know what the thing is, we can actually manage the potential impact by preparing in advance to manage the impact of something that we couldn't see. So in a way, is it all to do with making sure your project is resilient? That's the key word. You haven't been reading my notes, have you? Flexibility and resilience are the two keys. And that's really what business continuity is about. And a lot of our processes are not flexible and not resilient. People view their, their project as like a railway line. And the railway line is the plan, and the starting point is our project inception, the destination is our project conclusion. We have a timetable as we go down the track, which is our, our project schedule. We have a, a budget, which is the ticket price to go from this station to this station. The stations are the milestones. The project is the train, and you just start off down the project track and you end up where you want to be. And it's just not like that because things happen along the way. It's more like sailing a boat as, as you go across the water, a small boat. You know, the wind blows and the tides come up and something comes in front of you and someone falls overboard. And you have to adjust as you go along. It's not just following the track of the project plan. Um, and so if we build resilience and flexibility into our projects, then we can respond to the things that happen, the tides of change and, and the winds and so on, whether they be helpful or unhelpful, of course. Black swans can be helpful to us because they're risks like any other risk. There are threatening black swans and there are um, uh, helpful black swans, you know, threats and opportunities. But how do you build in uh, resilience into your, into your project? Yes, it's, it's a nice theory to say projects should be flexible and resilient, but how? And I think there's a number of things we can do. Um, first of all, very clear objectives. You know, when you're sailing a boat across the bay and you can draw a straight line on the water that says, I want to go from here to here, but as soon as you set off, something takes you off track. You need to know where you're aiming at in order to get back on track. And a lot of projects don't have clear objectives. So the clear objective, knowing where we're aiming at, is, is a first requisite, a prerequisite for being resilient because resilience and flexibility is about recovering back to the position uh, that you were in before the deforming force came in that, that drew you off track or that squashed you down. So you bounce back. Uh, another nice word for resilience is, is bounce back ability. You know. But you need to know where you are heading and have that as a clear view. Strong change management is obviously important. Uh, so we have the ability to um, uh, assess the potential impact of a change and respond to that appropriately. Uh, flexible processes. So if you have processes that in insist on certain gateways and certain signatures and certain reports being published and so on, and then something changes and your process is not flexible, then obviously that's going to hold you back. So flexible processes. Empowered teams, so teams who know within the scope of their authority, they have clear objectives, uh, sub-objectives, they have um, clear accountabilities, they have resources, um, and the flexibility to actually achieve those in the best possible way. So an empowered team within limits. Um, and then I think something about a strong project culture, which uh, resilience is often about what's in here, and whether you have the ability to cope with change, to, to tolerate ambiguity. So a strong team culture that's well led, that, that respects everybody and, and shows their value to the team and to the project. Um, I think that will help them to be resilient. But it is as much about process and, uh, and um, uh, technology as about people. And I think all of these different steps to build resilience um, can be very easily built into the normal project management approach. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.